Greetings in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope and soon returning King. Welcome to Christ in Prophecy. In our continuing exploration for Jesus in the Old Testament, we've arrived at the second minor prophet, Joel. We don't know much about Joel except that he was the son of Pethuel and was raised up to warn the nation of Judah about a great locust scourge that had descended upon the land. And as with such calamities, there was a spiritual dimension to be considered. Joel urged the farmers and priests and elders, the entire nation, to be ashamed, lament, fast, and cry out to the Lord. His recommended response to adversity would shock some Christian leaders today who pronounce unceasing prosperity. Living about 830 B.C., or 2850 years ago, Joel also realized that the locust hordes foreshadowed an even greater outpouring of wrath known as the Day of the Lord. Joel's prophecy followed a familiar pattern. He advised of a calamity, spoken of an even greater catastrophe to follow, and urged people to turn to God in repentance. The culmination of Joel's vision involved all the nations of the earth gathered in the Valley of Jehoshaphat, the Valley of Decision. His message is timely to us today because, as Joel foresaw so many years ago, very soon the armies of heaven will be on the march. I'm very excited about our guest today. He is a recognized expert in ancient texts, including Greek and Hebrew, and yet he doesn't have an advanced degree. As a matter of fact, Lee Brainerd proves that just by studying the Word of God, you can gain understanding, and that's why we wanted him to come today to this episode of Christ in Prophecy. I first heard Lee at a pre-tribulation conference with all sorts of other accredited doctors, but Lee was a man with tremendous wisdom and insight. Lee, I'm so glad you could join us today. Thank you for being here. Tim, I'm excited to be here today. Well, not more so than me and Nathan for having you. But I want to jump right in and have you tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to be an expert in Greek and Hebrew. Well, I was a young believer in the Second Ranger Battalion at Fort Lewis, Washington. And I was reading a magazine article. I don't even remember which magazine it was. And there was a story about Christmas Evans, the one-eyed Baptist preacher from Anglesey, England. <laughs> And this guy taught himself, he was an uneducated man, and he taught himself Greek, Hebrew, and Latin. And I found myself thinking, what do we need to know Greek, Hebrew, and Latin for? Well, I come to find out, of course, the New Testament was written in Greek. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew and, and a little Aramaic. And Latin was the, one of the earliest translations. And I went after it. I went to a Christian bookstore. I bought a Greek grammar, a Greek New Testament, and a Greek lexicon, and I went after it. And you just began to learn. I find that fascinating. And at the presentation you gave at the conference, you talked about some of the other experts. And Nathan was going to ask you, I think, even about one in particular of recent. Yeah, because it was a fascinating presentation. Uh, Lee, I actually met you because you're also a Christian fiction writer, the Planet Shaken series. you become one of my favorite authors. I can't wait till the fourth in the series comes. But then you sent me this, and I was like, wait a minute, he's getting deep in the theology. And then I saw you at the pre-trib conference, and you were speaking about ancient texts. You were looking for proofs of the pre-trib rapture, like Ephraim of Syria and Arrhenius, who yeah. was the uh, student of Polycarp, who was the student of John. So maybe you could tell us, give us some of those fascinating insights that wowed Tim and me. Okay. Well, I had actually been doing the research for this apostasia book. Okay. And I'm looking up every reference to the Greek word apostasia from its first appearance up till 500 AD. And I, I was going through these references, and I was in Ephraim of Syria, and as I'm reading through the passage... That's get the, a book or a writing. Yeah, the writings You're of Ephraim in, the Syrian. Okay. From yes. what year about? Well, he was in the 4th century, so he's in okay. the 300s. Okay. He has over 150 uh, Greek <clears throat> works that have never been translated into English. Hmm. I'm, I'm looking at this passage, and I'm reading the context, and in the context I see a pre-tribulation rapture passage that I have never seen quoted in anybody's writings before. And you, you look into it and you come to discover that there was only one known reference to the rapture that's from Ephraim of Syria's Latin works. And so as I, I set my apostasia research aside and I went through all those 150 works searching for rapture references and I came to discover over 30 pre-tribulation rapture passages and 10 of them were crystal clear, and those were the ones I presented in Dallas at the wow. pre-trib study group. So someone actually was talking about the pre-trib rapture before Darby? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, that, and that's a really good point, because so often today, people push around this uh, 
theory or this uh, story that the pre-trib rapture didn't exist until Darby invented it around 1830 or he got it from Margaret MacDonald who got it from yeah, a false a uh, vision given to her from a lying spirit. That's an attempt spirit. to discredit what is historically yeah. uh, mm -hmm. a belief tracking all the way back, as you said, to Polycarp, to Irenaeus, yes. and to others that were very early in the church understanding what the apostles were teaching, which is Jesus is coming yeah. soon. And so now with the discoveries of the pre-trib rapture that I found in just the writings of Ephraim the Syrian alone, there's now over 60 pre-tribulation rapture references in the early church fathers. And I'm finding more in Eusebius, which is going to be a project down the road. <laughs> and, and you say you find these writings, but you're a man who lives in North Dakota. So yes. through the miracle of modern technology, you're able to access these ancient writings probably online or getting them delivered to you. Absolutely. I use the TLG website, the Thesaurus Linguae Grecae, but it's a virtually exhaustive database of all the uh, classical, koine, patristic, in Byzantine Greek. Wow. Well, you know, many Christians buy into the lie, Lee, and this is why I'm so excited about, about you as a right. living testimony. They buy into the lie that you have to have a degree in hermeneutics or systematic theology to begin understanding the Bible's Revelation, or revelations. Right. And so if you don't have all those ancient uh, texts memorized or known, you can't possibly understand it. But you prove that you can learn, and by Absolutely. studying, you can teach yourself Greek, you can teach yourself Hebrew, and you can delve into the Bible. And even if languages are not a gift that you possess, for instance, I don't consider myself to be gifted in languages, you are. Yeah. Studying the Word of God gives us revelations and understanding that the Holy Spirit lays on our hearts. And so, here at Lamb and Lion Ministries, we obviously do not denigrate those who have advanced degrees, we respect right. them. But I'm so encouraged that somebody who is essentially self-taught in the languages can prove anybody can open up the Word of God and have great understanding. Oh, absolutely. And I've discovered that there are so many tools available today. There, mm -hmm. The books that are in print or that are reprinted or that are online with available sources and some of the teaching tools, you've got... Uh, strong Greek and Hebrew teachers giving their material for free on websites and on YouTube. Um, anyone that just rolls up their sleeves and wants to do a little work, there isn't a subject of theology or a biblical language that you can't learn on your own. Mm, that's wonderful. Gives yeah. me hope. Yes. That does give me hope. Uh, I took uh, four years of Bible college and another four of seminary, and I walked away barely understanding anything about Hebrew and Greek. And you taught yourself, and I saw you actually stand up in front of all those Greek and Hebrew professors as they threw questions at you, and you're answering them. You just, your ability blows my mind, man. Well, let's go back. We're talking about the book of Joel here. We're yes. looking for Jesus in the Old Testament, particularly in the book of Joel. Joel had to deal with a catastrophic disaster that was befalling the Jewish people at the time. Could you tell us about that disaster? And does that does God still use that type of way to get our attention today? Oh, absolutely. Um, the Jews have a, a long history of being devastated by judgments, like the judgment of the Babylonians, uh, the judgment through the Medo-Persians. Yeah. We have the judgments prior to the Babylonians with the Assyrians. And the Lord used these pagan nations to judge Israel. And this oftentimes seems very confusing to Christians because why would God use people that are wicked to judge the godly? Well, this is just part of pro God's program for disciplining His people, mm -hmm. getting their attention. Mm -hmm. And yes, I think this principle of God using the ungodly world around us to joggle us, to jostle us, to get our attention, to restore our focus, very much uh, applicable today. And what are the Jewish people at the time facing? Well, um, in the book of Joel, they were facing, for instance, uh, the plagues of locusts that were just completely right. devastating their crops. And not just w like one plague of locusts, they got four different locusts that are mentioned. Mm. I think that we've seen, even this year in particular, uh, how nations rising against nations. And sometimes you think, well, the aggressor is more evil than the, the quote unquote victim nation. Yeah. But again, that is a, a tough faith recognition of what has happened throughout God's interaction with Israel. And so, we who have faith uh, have to just trust that God has everything in His control. Amen. You know, you also mentioned that all you have to do to understand is study. I like what Dr. Reagan has pointed out. Sometimes people say, oh, it'll all pan out. I'm a pan-millennialist. Yeah. And really what that says to some of us is, well, you just haven't 
been willing to study. That's right. And it does require that we engage, that we spend time studying the Word of God in order to gain understanding. But Joel's prophecy quickly turns just from the the locust plague of that day and age yes. to the coming day of the Lord. And he describes it as a day of darkness and gloom. And he, it is very horrible to contemplate what that day of the Lord will entail. But in the midst of his vision, he sees the Lord Amen. commanding a mighty army of heaven. And so in addition to manifesting what I would call repentance uh, and encouraging that, Joel tells his listeners to return to the Lord your God for He is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness, and relenting of evil. Amen. Well, what's amazing to me in this passage you, you just were reciting, a lot of evangelicals have this idea today that the Old Testament God was a mean, harsh God, and they have a hard time reconciling that with the New Testament. But when I read the Old Testament, what I, I do see the judgments. I do see the tragedies. But what I see is a God who's forgiveness and grace and mercy with the nation of Israel is almost unfathomable. Mm, yes. The Jewish people, thinking of it as agrarian society, you're a farmer. Yes. And you have a bunch of locusts come and eat everything. You're facing starvation. That's right. And we're seeing supply chains this year be disrupted. We're living in a time of supply changes. But then Joel also quotes God. He describes after this, and he says, after all this devastation that the people then are come back to him and they repent, and he says, and it shall come to pass afterwards, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Is that, did that happen then? Did it happen in the New Testament? Is that happening now? Is it the future? Is that a prophecy? Well, the prophecy was partially fulfilled at Pentecost mm, yeah. when the Lord took the Jewish people um, yeah. he, he pruned that olive tree and he started grafting in Gentiles into the earthly testimony. And that Holy Spirit promise was poured out in a partial uh, fulfillment on that early church. I think we're going to see the uh, full fulfillment of this in the last days, in the 70th week, when the Lord has restored His testimony on earth with the Jewish people and He's going to pour out that promise in fullness on His people and unite Judah and Israel just like He once united the Gentiles and the Jews. You know, I think that's an important point you make that sometimes the Lord pre-fills yes. prophecies and there's a coming fulfillment. And yes. we have to realize that the, the ultimate fulfillment has not arrived. Uh, Peter did in his first sermon there at Pentecost cite Joel. So yes. this, this prophecy has great relevance, not Absolutely. just for the founding of the church at Pentecost, but even still today as we look forward. And yet beyond those locust hordes that we've already touched on, much of Joel's prophecy focuses on the day of the Lord. Amen. So for those of our viewers who may not be familiar with this term, the day of the Lord, what does that really mean? Well, we have to think in the concept of, of the full day. Uh, when we look at the 24-hour day in the English language, uh, we typically start the day in a technical sense at midnight, and it goes 24 hours around. But we can also talk about the crack of dawn, which is the twinkling of the morning star. We can talk about uh, civil or civic or civil daylight, which is the sun is 6 degrees below the horizon. There's nautical daylight, 12 degrees below the horizon. There is astronomical uh, twilight, which is 18 degrees below the horizon. Um, and then there's a, just the common sense, which is the sunrise. Well, when we look at the full picture of the day of the Lord in the Bible, we have two primary aspects that we see. We see the, the dawning of the day with the twinkling of the morning star, which is associated with the rapture of the church. And we see the rising of the sun with the full arrival of the day, which is associated with Israel in the second coming of the Lord. And then everything in between is ever increasing daylight, which is the day of the Lord creeping up little by little upon mm. the world. Wow. And that fills the Daniel's 70th week of prophecy, right? Absolutely. So the day of the Lord would be then from the Antichrist being recognized as making a covenant with Israel yeah. to Jesus Christ's return. Is the day of the Lord, or does the day of the Lord extend beyond that? Well, I would even uh, have the, the day of the Lord begin in a sense right with the twinkling of the morning star, that the, the rapture is the first warning shot fired over the bow of the world mm. that the day of the Lord is coming. 
That's the first warning shot. And then we see that, of course, increase during the 70th week. And then when it, the, the fullness of the day comes, that is full judgment. There is no more grace. And so almost after that sun rises, after yep. the Lord returns, yes. uh, that we enter that millennial kingdom. But there will be no shadow, no hiding from That's the right. brightness of, of yep. the sun light as He reveals all uh, and people are judged for their righteous deeds or their evil deeds. Yes. And I think it's perfectly legitimate to regard the entire millennium as the day of the Lord in a figurative sense. Mm. Interesting. Because His glory will be manifested for that entire thousand years. Well, you got the church removed before the day of the Lord, and then yes. we get the prophecy which I just read where the people are, it's almost like we're back into the Old Testament where there's yes. the tongues and evidences of the Holy Spirit right. to move people to come to Jesus because it's a time of tribulation and That's to get right. people on their knees to return to Jesus Christ. Uh, as you studied the book of, of Joel in the original languages and all, did you find new insights or, or something come up at you that really kind of riveted you about the book? Something you walked away with and said, hey, this made Joel really stand out to me. Well, one of the things that did stand out was in uh, Joel chapter 2, mm -hmm. where we have uh, some of the versions say they will fall upon the sword and they shall not be wounded. Uh, some versions will say they'll fall upon the weapons or, or something similar to that and they'll not be wounded. And I looked into that and it realized that uh, whether there might be little debate on how to technically translate this Hebrew word, but it's obviously in the, in the realm of, of weapons of warfare, whether you're going to translate a generic term like sword or in a more generic term like weapons of warfare. But the whole idea that this army that descends from heaven can fall upon the sword and not be wounded or killed is amazing. Now, can you imagine riding down from heaven on those white horses? And here's the army of the world. They're all gathered at Armageddon, and they're thinking that they're going to meet the army coming down from heaven because what do they think? They're the UFO army or something. Who knows what they think they are? <laughs> and they open up with their 50 caliber machine guns and their grenade launchers and their rocket launchers and nuclear bombs, whatever they got. And you have 50 caliber bullets ripping right through you. You say, wow, that felt weird. <laughs> <laughs> it won't harm us at all. Yeah, so it's almost right. like the book of Joel with the armies descending is a reflection of the armies that Jesus was talking about coming. Not only the evil hordes that will predominate the tribulation, yeah. but the armies of God returning. And is that where then we see Jesus in the book of Joel? I yeah, where so. do we see Jesus in the book of Joel? Is that it? Because it's pointing to Him throughout. Well, yes, because see in the, in the uh, for instance in Matthew 24 when we talk about uh, at the end of the tribulation, it says immediately after the tribulation, there'll be the signs in the heavens. The sun and the moon are going to be darkened. The stars are going to fall. And there'll be a great shaking. Well, those signs in the heavens, wherever you see them in the Old Testament or in the New Testament, they're associated with the end of the tribulation and the coming of the Lord. And those signs, that heralds the coming of the Messiah. Mm. And when you see that army coming down from heaven, that's another one. That's associated with the Lord. We know from Revelation 19 that at the front of that horde of Soldiers on white horses is the Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ. You know, there's one other warning that's offered at the end of the book of Joel, and I don't think we can overlook, because God promises that one day Judah will be blessed beyond measure, but that His, the Lord's indignation, will burn against those nations that have done violence to the sons that's of right. Israel. And I think He will be quite displeased with those who did not actually seek to bless His chosen people, and perhaps even those who have attempted or currently now are attempting to divide the land that He promised to them. That's right. That passage brings my mind to Matthew 25. We have the separation of the sheep and the goats because a lot of people when they think of the sheep and the goats, they're thinking just two classes of people. They see the unbelieving Gentiles and they see the believing Gentiles, but there's actually three groups of people there. We also have the Jewish people there. Hmm. The, these, the Lord's brethren. They're already been gathered first and then the Gentiles are gathered all around the throne of the Lord in the valley of Jehoshaphat. And the, the ungodly, their unbelief is proven by the fact that they did not bless the people of God, which was the children of Israel. And the godly were blessed because they did prove their faith by blessing wow. the children of God. And, and the Lord's attitude is, if you did this to my brethren, you did it to me. And if you didn't do it to my brethren, you didn't do it to me. And the timing of the sheep goat judgment being the end of the tribulation, That's Jesus' right. return. Whoever survived the tribulation is left alive, is gathered to the valley of Jehoshaphat. The goats go on to Hades to await punishment, right. the righteous into the millennial kingdom. 
I think Amen. that's a beautiful Amen. insight because most of us have probably thought about those who are the least of these as just, you know, the, the poor and the oppressed around us. Yes. But the Lord also always has the Jewish people as the apple of His eye. That's and we right. need to be looking for ways to bless them and again, certainly not try to take them off of their land or divide their land in violation of the Word That's of right. God. And I don't have a, a problem if Christians want to take an analogy from Matthew 25 and apply it in the secondary sense to downtrodden Christians or your downtrodden neighbors. But we have to understand this is just an application. The intended principle is the, is the people of Israel mm. in the tribulation. Well, Lee, in terms of a, a Christian who says, well, I want to learn, I want to understand, how can I, because I don't speak Greek or Hebrew, right, right. and all I have is my English translation, what would you encourage them to do? Well, if all you have at your fingertips is the English, basically 99.5% of the, of the difficulties you're going to face on what does this word mean, what does this passage mean, how, what's the meaning of this doctrine, you can find those answers without knowledge of the Greek or Hebrew if you have, uh, you're using, like, let's say, two or three literal English translations, you're comparing them, but you're also comparing passages, parallel passages, related passages. They, the Bible is its own commentary on mm. itself, and it's the best commentary. And if we develop the habit of going to commentaries first rather than the commentary of the Scriptures first, mm -hmm. we're going to make a mistake because we're going to end up leaning on men. And this brings up another thought too because one of the biggest difficulties we face as believers is not learning the letter of the text. I know a lot of believers that have a strong knowledge of the letter of the text and they are operating at a very superficial level and they're very good there. I don't want to knock that at all. But the fact of the matter is we need to learn to think for ourselves and we need to be willing to be regarded as wrong or we're gonna, not going to attain all the truth that we can possibly attain. We need to be like the Bereans in that point and That's let right. Scripture inform us. I will say, tell you my favorite commentary is a concordance. Amen. Because Amen. a concordance will point me to other passages that illuminate what I'm reading. And, and sometimes the Spirit will lead me to that, but if I get a, a brain freeze in terms of where does that uh, co connected verse located, a concordance will at least point me back to the Word of God. So it is my favorite commentary. Amen. It should be everybody's favorite commentary. And as Nathan would know, there are lots of Greek uh, translations, or at least I can go and look up a yes. word in Greek and maybe for one word explore the, the oh, meaning. Oh, Strong's the Numbers are yes. a great place. I go all the time like, what does this word actually mean? Strong's will tell you what the original Greek or Hebrew means, yeah. and then you can figure it out for yourself. Yeah, yeah. and there's a lot of uh, useful Greek tools. And you don't mm -hmm. even have to buy or purchase something. You can go to Blue Letter Bible. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Logo online. software. Yes, yeah. and online it will give you a wealth of information. So what a tremendous resource. Amen. Just, just develop in your heart the ability to stand alone on the plain statements of Scripture and develop your theology from the plain statements of Scripture. The, the essence of all theological error is man being stumbled by a philosophical presupposition which causes them to question whether they can take plain statements of Scripture at face value. Very powerful. If people want to know more about what you have to teach in the Bible, yeah. where do they go to find that out? Go to my website, soothkeep.info. Okay. Or you can also find me on Twitter. Just look for Soothkeep. Soothkeep. Okay. Yeah. Well, Lee, I told you uh, how excited I was to have you, and I've shared with our viewers just your living testimony of a man who is, quote unquote, self taught Greek and Hebrew, yep. but really gifted in that regard, but you are so willing to share it and how by studying the Word of God, all of us, and again, even, even the likes of me, can gain understanding because the Holy Spirit illuminates Amen. our hearts. Amen. And so, I am so glad you came. Joel said in uh, his book in chapter 2, verse 1, Blow a trumpet in Zion, for the day of the Lord is coming. Surely it is near. And we, we actually sense that same kind that's of right. urgency today with everything that's happening around us. But until he does, Lee, may he continue to bless you in your work. Amen. And, and Tim, may the Lord continue to bless Lamb and Lion. This ministry has been a blessing to people for four plus decades. Yes. Well. And may it continue until the trumpet blows. Amen. As a man who taught himself Greek and Hebrew, Lee Brainerd is both inspirational and convicting. He proves that anyone can gain insight to the Word of God through careful study. 
Well, I appreciate the fact that he is widely respected by credentialed Bible scholars like the ones who gather each year at the pre-trib conference. Lee's insights always result in edifying the saints and pointing to our Savior. You know, that's exactly what the prophet Joel did as well. We realize that his pronouncement of a locust plague would have been horrifying to an agricultural society. But Joel's faithfulness to the Lord led him to convey God's message to his wayward people in an effort to edify the nation of Judah. Inherent in that pronouncement of judgment lies a message of hope. Had the king and the people of Judah repented of their wickedness, God would have indeed relented just as He did with Nineveh. But the locust plague was a harbinger of an even greater calamity, an invasion by a foreign army in the short term and the great and awesome day of the Lord in the long term. Even now, a day is coming when the Messiah will return to wreak justice on the earth. He will no longer be meek and mild, but will come to pour out the wrath of God and judge the nations. Joel records the word of the Lord this way, Multitudes, multitudes, in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. And soon it will be too late to choose to follow Jesus Christ. Each person's decision to accept or reject Him will be locked in. And as Tim has described before, those who choose not to decide have in essence rejected Him already. So, before the Lord roars from Zion and utters His voice from Jerusalem, now is the time to embrace the Messiah as our Savior. Joel opens with a dramatic vision of a natural catastrophe, a locust plague. He then transitions to a military onslaught and finally a cataclysmic battle between the nations of the world and the Lord Himself that will end in everlasting judgment. But he also offers great hope, the promise of deliverance for the people of God and restoration for the land that was subjected to a curse for so long. In agricultural terms, the Lord promises early and latter rain to ensure the threshing floors will be full of grain and the vats will overflow with new wine and oil. Even more significant, God promised that in the end times He will pour out His Spirit on all mankind so that your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, your young men will see visions. And that is beginning to happen today as people around the world testify to being visited by angels unaware and even Jesus Himself calling them to salvation. I'm glad you mentioned angel pointing to Jesus Christ, Nathan, because today we are featuring your book, The Mighty Angels of Revelation. Well, thanks, Tim. Well, folks, if you want to meet the 72 angels and angelic groups found in the book of Revelation, then this book will be a blessing to you. For a gift of $20 or more, we'll be glad to send you a copy. Just call the number you see on the screen or visit our website at lamblion.com. Well, that's all the time we have. So, whether you are on a mountaintop or in a valley today, we pray that you have already chosen wisely, deciding to embrace Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord and following Him all the days of your life. Until next week, this is Tim Moore and Nathan Jones saying, Look up and be watchful, for the Lord, the Commander of the armies of heaven, is coming soon. Yeah.